Section 30 of A Book of Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jean Lang. Section 30 The Death of Baldur. I heard a voice that cried, Baldur the beautiful is dead, is dead. And through the misty air, passed like the mournful cry of sunward sailing cranes. Longfellow Among the gods of Greece we find gods and goddesses who do unworthy deeds, but none to act the permanent part of villain of the play. In the mythology of the Norsemen, we have a god who is wholly treacherous and evil, ever the villain of the piece, cunning, malicious, vindictive, and cruel, the god Loki. And as his foil and his victim we have Baldur, best of all gods, most beautiful, most greatly beloved, Baldur was the Galahad of the court of Odin the king, his father. My strength is of the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. No impure thing was to be found in his dwelling. None could impugn his courage, yet ever he counseled peace, ever was gentle and infinitely wise, and his beauty was as the beauty of the whitest of all the flowers of the Northland, called after him Baldur's Bra. The god of the Norsemen was essentially a god of battles, and we are told by great authorities that Baldur was originally a hero who fought on the earth and who in time came to be deified. Even if it be so, it is good to think that a race of warriors could worship one whose chief qualities were wisdom, purity, and love. In perfect happiness, loving and beloved Baldur lived in Asgard with his wife Nanna, until a night when his sleep was assailed by horrible dreams of evil omen. In the morning he told the gods that he had dreamed that death, a thing till then unknown in Asgard, had come and cruelly taken his life away. Solemnly the gods debated how this ill happening might be averted, and Freya, his mother, fear for her best beloved hanging heavy over her heart, took upon herself the task of laying under oath fire and water, iron and all other metals, trees and shrubs, birds, beasts and creeping things, to do no harm to Baldur. With eager haste she went from place to place, nor did she fail to exact the oath from anything in all nature, animate or inanimate, save one only. A twig of mistletoe, tender and fair, grew high above the field, and such a little thing it was, with its dainty green leaves and waxen white berries, nestling for protection under the strong arm of a great oak, that the goddess passed it by. Assuredly, no scathe could come to Baldur the Beautiful from a creature so insignificant, and Freya returned to Asgard, well pleased with her quest. Then indeed was there joy and laughter amongst the gods, for each one tried how he might slay Baldur, but neither sword nor stone, hammer nor battle-axe could work him any ill. Odin alone remained unsatisfied. Mounted on his eight-footed grey steed, Sleipnir, he galloped off in haste to consult the giant prophetess Angerbotha, who was dead and had to be followed to Niflheim, the chilly underworld that lies far north from the world of men, and where the sun never comes. Hel, the daughter of Loki and of Angerbotha, was queen of this dark domain. There, in a bitterly cold place, she received the souls of all who died of sickness or old age. Care was her bed, hunger her dish, starvation her knife. 
her walls were high and strong and her bolts and bars huge half blue was her skin and half the color of human flesh a goddess easy to know and in all things very stern and grim Dacent. in her kingdom no soul that passed away in glorious battle was received nor any that fought out the last of life in a fierce combat with the angry waves of the sea only those who died ingloriously were her guests when he had reached the realm of hell odin found that a feast was being prepared and the couches were spread as for an honored guest with rich tapestry and with gold for many a year had angerbotha rested there in peace and it was only by chanting a magic spell and tracing those runes which have power to raise the dead that odin awoke her when she raised herself terrible and angry from her tomb he did not tell her that he was the mighty father of gods and men he only asked her for whom the great feast was prepared and why hell was spreading her couches so gorgeously and to the father of baldur she revealed the secret of the future that baldur was the expected guest and that by his blind brother hodur his soul was to be hastened to the shades who then would avenge him asked the father great wrath in his heart and the prophetess replied that his death should be avenged by vali his youngest brother who should not wash his hands nor comb his hair until he had brought the slayer of baldur to the funeral pyre but yet another question odin would fain have answered who he asked would refuse to weep at baldur's death theriat the prophetess knowing that her questioner could be none other than odin for to no mortal man could be known so much of the future refused for evermore to speak and returned to the silence of her tomb and odin was forced to mount his steed and to return to his own land of warmth and pleasure on his return he found that all was well with baldur thus he tried to still his anxious heart and to forget the feast in the chill regions of niflheim spread for the sun who was to him the dearest and to laugh with those who tried in vain to bring scathe to baldur only one among those who looked at those sports and grew merry as he whom they loved stood like a great cliff against which the devouring waves of the fierce north sea beat and foam and crash in vain had malice in his heart as he beheld the wonder in the evil heart of loki there came a desire to overthrow the god who was beloved by all gods and by all men he hated him because he was pure and the mind of loki was as a stream into which all the filth of the world is discharged he hated him because baldur was truth and loyalty and he loki was treachery and dishonor he hated him because to loki there came never a thought that was not full of meanness and greed and cruelty and vice and baldur was indeed one sans pure et sans reproach thus loki taking upon himself the form of a woman went to fenselir the palace all silver and gold where dwelt freya the mother of baldur the goddess sat in happy majesty spinning the clouds and when loki apparently a gentle old woman passed by where she sat and then paused and asked as if amazed what were the shouts of merriment that she heard the smiling goddess replied all things on earth have sworn to me never to injure baldur and all the gods use their weapons against him in vain baldur is safe forevermore all things queried loki and freya answered all things but the mistletoe no harm can come to him from a thing so weak that it only lives by the lives of others then the vicious heart of loki grew joyous quickly he went to where the mistletoe grew cut a slender green branch shaped it into a point and sought the blind god hodur hodur stood aside while the other gods merrily pursued their sport 
why dost thou not take aim at baldur with a weapon that fails and so join in the laughter asked loki and hodur sadly made answer well dost thou know that darkness is my lot nor have i aught to cast at my brother then loki placed in his hand the shaft of mistletoe and guided his aim and well and surely hodur cast the dart he waited then for the merry laughter that followed ever on the onslaught of those against him whom none could do harm but a great and terrible cry smote his ears baldur the beautiful is dead is dead on the ground lay baldur a white flower cut down by the scythe of the moor and all through the realm of the gods and all through the land of the northmen there arose a cry of bitter lamentation that was the greatest woe that ever befell gods and men says the story the sound of terrible mourning in place of laughter brought freya to where on the floor lay baldur dead and round lay thickly strewn swords axes darts and spears which all the gods in sport had lightly thrown at baldur whom no weapon pierced or clove but in his breast stood fixed the fatal bow of mistletoe matthew arnold when she saw what had befallen him freya's grief was a grief that refused to be comforted but when the gods overwhelmed with sorrow knew not what course to take she quickly commanded that one should ride to niflheim and offer hell a ransom if she would permit baldur to return to asgard hermoder the nimble another of the sons of odin undertook the mission and mounted on his father's eight-footed steed he speedily reached the ice-cold domain of hell there he found baldur sitting on the noblest seat of those who feasted ruling among the people of the underworld with burning words hermoder pled with hell that she would permit baldur to return to the world of gods and the world of men by both of whom he was so dearly beloved said hell come then if baldur was so dear beloved and this is true and such a loss is heaven's hear how to heaven may baldur be restored show me through all the world the signs of grief fails but one thing to grieve here baldur stops let all that lives and moves upon the earth weep him and all that is without life weep let gods men brutes beweep him plants and stones so shall i know the loss was dear indeed and bend my heart and give him back to heaven matthew arnold gladly hermoder made answer all things shall weep for baldur swiftly he made his perilous return journey and at once when the gods heard what hell had said messengers were dispatched all over the earth to beg all things living and dead to weep for baldur and so dear to all nature was the beautiful god that the messengers everywhere left behind them a track of the tears that they caused to be shed meantime in asgard preparations were made for baldur's pyre the longest of the pines in the forest were cut down by the gods and piled up in a mighty pyre on the deck of his great ship ringhorn the largest in the world seventy ells and four extended on the grass the vessel's keel high above it gilt and splendid rose the figurehead ferocious with its crest of steel longfellow down to the seashore they bore the body and laid it on the pyre with rich gifts all round it and the pine trunks of the northern forests that formed the pyre they covered with gorgeous tapestries and fragrant flowers and when they had laid him there with all love and gentleness and his fair young wife nana looked on his beautiful still face sorrow smote her heart so that it was broken and she fell down dead tenderly they laid her beside him and by him too they laid the bodies of his horse and his hounds 
which they slew to bear their master company in the land whither his soul had fled and around the pyre they twined thorns the emblem of sleep yet even then they looked for his speedy return radiant and glad to come home to a sunlit land of happiness and when the messengers who were to have brought tidings of his freedom were seen drawing near eagerly they crowded to hear the glad words all creatures weep and baldur shall return but with them they brought not hope but despair all things living and dead had wept save one only a giantess who sat in a dark cave had laughed them to scorn with devilish merriment she mocked neither in life nor yet in death gave he me gladness let hell keep her prey then all knew that yet a second time had baldur been betrayed and that the giantess was none other than loki and loki realizing the fierce wrath of odin and of the other gods fled before them yet could not escape his doom and grief unspeakable was that of gods and of men when they knew that in the chill realm of the inglorious dead baldur must remain until the twilight of the gods had come until old things had passed away and all things had become new not only the gods but the giants of the storm and frost and the frost elves came to behold the last of him whom they loved then the pyre was set alight and the great vessel was launched and glided out to sea with its sails of flame they launched the burning ship it floated far away over the misty sea till like the sun it seemed sinking beneath the waves baldur returned no more yet ere he parted from his dead son odin stooped over him and whispered a word in his ear and there are those who say that as the gods in infinite sorrow stood on the beach staring out to sea darkness fell and only a fiery track on the waves showed whither he had gone whose passing had robbed asgard and the earth of their most beautiful thing heavy as the weight of chill death's remorseless hand would have been their hearts but for the knowledge of that word they knew that with the death of baldur the twilight of the gods had begun and that by much strife and infinite suffering down through the ages the work of their purification and hallowing must be wrought but when all were fit to receive him and peace and happiness reigned again on earth and in heaven baldur would come back for the word was resurrection so perish the old gods but out of the sea of time rises a new land of song fairer than the old longfellow heartily know when half gods go the gods arrive Emerson. End of the Death of Baldur. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section thirty one of A Book of Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jane Lang. Section 31. Beowulf. He was of mankind, in might the strongest. Longfellow's Translation. Whether those who read it be scholars who would argue about the origin and date of the poem, ingenious theorists who would fain use all the fragmentary tales and rhymes of the nursery as parts of a vast jigsaw puzzle of nature myths or merely simple folk who read a tale for a tale's sake every reader of the poem of beowulf must own that it is one of the finest stories ever written it is the most ancient heroic poem in the germanic language and was brought to britain by the winged hats who sailed across the grey North Sea to conquer and to help to weld that great amalgam of peoples into what is now 
the British race. But once it had arrived in England, the legend was put into a dress that the British-born could more readily appreciate. In all probability, the scene of the story was a corner of that island of Zealand upon which Copenhagen now stands. But he who wrote down the poem for his countrymen, and who wrote it in the pure literary Anglo-Saxon of Wessex, painted the scenery from the places that he and his readers knew best. And if you should walk along the breezy, magnificent, rugged Yorkshire coast for twelve miles, from Whitby northward to the top of Bowlby Cliff, you would find it quite easy to believe that it was there amongst the high sea cliffs that Beowulf and his hearth sharers once lived, and there on the highest nests of our eastern coast, under a great barrow, that Beowulf was buried. Beowulfsby. Bowlby seems a quite easy transition. But the people of our island race have undoubtedly a gift for seizing the imports of other lands and hallmarking them as their own and in all probability the Beowulf of the heroic poem was one who lived and died in the land of Scandinavia. In Denmark, so goes the story, when the people were longing for a king, to their shores there drifted on a day when the white birds were screaming over the sea-tangle and wreckage that a stormy sea now sinking to rest was sweeping up on the shore a little boat in which, on a sheaf of ripe wheat, and surrounded by priceless weapons and jewels there lay a most beautiful babe who smiled in his sleep that he was the son of odin they had no doubt and they made him their king and served him faithfully and loyally for the rest of his life a worthy and a noble king was king skald skeffing a ruler on land and on the sea of which even as an infant he had had no fear but when many years had come and gone, and when Skyld Skeffing felt that death drew near, he called his nobles to him, and told them in what manner he fain would pass. So they did as he said, and in a ship they built a funeral pyre, and round it placed much gold and jewels, and on it laid a sheaf of wheat. Then with great pain and labour, for he was old and death's hand lay heavy upon him, the king climbed into the ship and stretched out his limbs on the pyre and said farewell to all his faithful people. And the ship drifted out with the tide, and the hearts of the watchers were heavy as they saw the sails of the vessel that bore him vanish into the grey, and knew that their king had gone back to the place from whence he came, and that they should look on his face no more. Behind him Skyld left descendants, and one after the other reigned over Denmark. It was in the reign of his great-grandson, Hrothgar, that there took place those things that are told in the story of Beowulf. A mighty king and warrior was Hrothgar, and far across the northern seas his fame spread wide, so that all the warriors of the land that he ruled were proud to serve under him in peace and in war to die for him during his long life he and his men never went forth in their black proud ships without returning with the joyous shouts of the victor with for cargo the rich spoil they had won from their enemies as he grew old hrothgar determined to raise for himself a mighty monument to the magnificence of his reign and so there was builded for him a vast hall with majestic towers and lofty pinnacles the finest banqueting hall that his skilled artificers could dream of. And when at length the hall was completed, Hrothgar gave a feast to all his thanes, and for days and for nights on end the great rafters of Heorot, as his palace was named, echoed the shouts and laughter of the mighty warriors and the music of the minstrels and the songs that they sang. A proud man was Hrothgar, on the night that the banquet was ended amidst the acclamations of his people and a proud and happy man he lay down to rest while his bodyguard of mighty warriors stretched themselves on the rush-strewn floor of the great room where they had feasted and deeply slumbered there now in the dark fens of that land there dwelt a monster fierce noisome and cruel a thing that loved evil and hated all that was joyous and good 
to its ears came the ring of the laughter and the shouts of king hrothgar's revellers and the sweet song of the gleeman and the melody of harps filled it with fierce hatred from its wallow in the marshes where the pestilent grey fog hung round its dwelling the monster known to all men as the grendel came forth to kill and to devour through the dark night across the lonely moorland it made its way and the birds of the moor flew screaming in terror before it and the wild creatures of the desolate country over which it padded clapped down in their coverts and trembled as it passed it came at length to the great hall where a fair troop of warrior thanes guarding it found he heedlessly sleeping they recked not of sorrow never a thought did they give to the grendel a haunter of marshes a holder of moors secret the land he inhabits dark wolf-haunted ways of the windy hillside by the treacherous tarn or where covered up in its mist the hill stream downward flows soundly slept hrothgar nor opened eye until in the bright light of the morning he was roused by terrified servants forgetful of his august royalty impelled by terror crying aloud their terrible tale they had come they said to lay on the floor of the banqueting hall sweet fresh rushes from the meadows and to clear away all trace of the feasting overnight but the two and thirty knights who in full armour had lain down to sleep were all gone and on the floor was the spoor of something foul and noisome and on the walls and on the trampled rushes were great and terrible smears of human blood they tracked the grendel back to the marsh from whence he had come and shuddered at the sight of bestial footprints that left bloodstains behind terrible indeed was the grief of hrothgar but still more terrible was his anger he offered a royal reward to any man who would slay the grendel and full gladly ten of his warriors pledged themselves to sleep that night in the great hall and to slay the grendel ere morning came but dawn showed once more a piteous sight again there were only trampled and blood-stained rushes with the loathsome smell of unclean flesh again the foul tracks of the monster were found where it had padded softly back to its noisome fins there were many brave men in the kingdom of hrothgar the dane and yet again did they strive to maintain the dignity of the great hall heorot and to uphold the honour of their king but through twelve dismal years the grendel took its toll of the bravest in the realm and to sleep in the place that hrothgar had built as monument to his magnificent supremacy ever meant for the sleeper shameful death well content was the grendel that grew fat and lusty amongst the grey mists of the black marshes unknowing that in the land of the goths there was growing to manhood one whose feet already should be echoing along that path from which death was to come in the realm of the goths hygelac was king and no greater hero lived in his kingdom than beowulf his own sister's son from the age of seven beowulf was brought up at the court of his uncle a great fair blue-eyed lad was beowulf lazy and very slow to wrath when he had at last become a yellow-haired giant of wondrous good temper and leisurely in movement the other young warriors of gothland had mocked at him as at one who was only a very huge very amiable child but like others of the same descent beowulf's anger if slow to kindle was a terrible fire once it began to flame a few of those flare-ups had shown the folk of his uncle's kingdom that no mean nor evil deed might lightly be done nor evil word spoken in the presence of beowulf in battle against the swedes no sword had hewn down more men than the sword of beowulf and when the champion swimmer of the land of the goths challenged the young giant beowulf to swim a match with him for five whole days they swam together a tempest driving down from the twilight land of the ice and snow parted them then 
and he who had been champion was driven ashore and thankfully struggled on to the beach of his own dear country once again but the foaming seas cast beowulf on some jagged cliffs and would fain have battered his body into broken fragments against them and as he fought and struggled to resist their raging cruelty mermaids and nixies and many monsters of the deep joined forces with the waves and strove to wrest his life from him and while with one hand he held on to a sharp rock with the other he dealt with his sword stark blows on those children of the deep who would fain have devoured him their bodies deep gashed and dead floated down to the coast of gothland and the king and all those who looked for the corpse of beowulf saw them amazed then at length came beowulf himself and with great gladness was he welcomed and the king his uncle gave him his treasured sword negling in token of his valor in the court of hrothgar the number of brave warriors ever grew smaller one man only had witnessed the terrible slaughter of one of those black knights and yet had kept his life he was a bard a scald and from the land where he had seen such grim horror he fled to the land of the goths and there in the court of the king he sang the gloomy tale of the never-ending slaughter of noble warriors by the foul grendel of the fens and moors beowulf listened enthralled to his song but those who knew him saw his eyes gleam as the good steel blade of a sword gleams when it is drawn for battle and when he asked his uncle to allow him to go to the land of the danes and slay this filthy thing his uncle smiled with no surprise and was very well content so it came to pass that beowulf in his black proud ship with fourteen trusty followers set sail from gothland for the kingdom of hrothgar the warden of the danish coast was riding his rounds one morning when he beheld from the white cliffs a strange war vessel making for the shore skilfully the men on board her ran her through the surf and beached her in a little creek between the cliffs and made her fast to a rock by stout cables only for a little time the valiant warden watched them from afar and then one man against fifteen he rode quickly down and challenged the warriors what are ye warlike men wielding bright weapons wearing gray corslets and boar adorned helmets who o'er the water paths come with your foaming keel ploughing the ocean's surge i was appointed warden of denmark's shores watch hold i by the wave that on this danish coast no deadly enemy leading troops over sea should land to injure none have here landed yet more frankly coming than this fair company and yet ye answer not the password of warriors and customs of kinsmen ne'er have mine eyes beheld a mightier warrior an earl more lordly than is he the chief of you he is no common man if looks belie him not he is a hero bold worthily weaponed anon must i know of your kindred and country lest ye of spies should go free on our danish soil now ye men from afar sailing the surging sea have heard my earnest thought best is a quick reply that i may swiftly know whence ye have hither come then beowulf with fearless eyes gazed in the face of the warden and told him simply and unboastfully who he was from whence he came and what was his errand he had come as the nation's deliverer to slay the thing that cometh in dark of night sateth his secret hate worketh through fearsome awe slaughter and shame with joy the warden heard his noble words my men shall beach your ship he said and make her fast with a barrier of oars against the greedy tide come with me to the king it was a gallant band that strode into heorot where sat the old king gloom overshadowing his soul and fit leader for a band of heroes was beowulf a giant figure in ring mail spear and shield gleaming in his hand 
and by his side the mighty sword Negeling. To Hrothgar, as to the warden, Beowulf told the reason of his coming, and hope began again to live in the heart of the king. That night the warriors from the land of the Goths were feasted in the great banqueting hall where, for twelve unhappy years, voices had never rung out so bravely and so merrily. The queen herself poured out the mead with which the king and the men from Gothland pledged each other, and with her own hand she passed the goblet to each one. When, last of all, it came to the guest of honour, Beowulf took the cup of mead from the fair queen and solemnly pledged himself to save the land from the evil thing that devoured it like a pestilence, or to die in his endeavour. Needs must I now perform knightly deeds in this hall, or here must meet my doom in darksome night. When darkness fell, the feast came to an end, and all left the hall save Beowulf and his fourteen followers. In their armour, with swords girt on their sides, the fourteen heroes lay down to rest. But Beowulf laid aside all his arms, and gave his sword to a thane to bear away for said he i have heard that that foul miscreant's dark and stubborn flesh wrecks not the force of arms hand to hand beowulf will grapple with the mighty foe from his fastnesses in the fens the grendel had heard the shouts of revelry and as the goths closed their eyes to sleep knowing they might open them again only to grapple with hideous death yet unafraid because of their sure belief that what is to be goes ever as it must, the monster roused himself. Through the dank, chill, clinging mists he came, and his breath made the poisonous miasma of the marshes more deadly as he padded over the shivering reeds and trembling rushes across the bleak moorland and the high cliffs where the fresh tang of the grey sea was defiled by the hideous stench of a foul beast of prey there was fresh food for him to-night he knew some blood more potent than any that for twelve years had come his bestial way and he hastened on with greedy eagerness nightmare incarnate he found the great door of the banqueting hall bolted and barred but one angry wrench set at naught the little precautionary measures of mere men the dawn was breaking dim and grey and very chill when beowulf heard the stealthy tread without and the quick following crash of the bolts and bars that gave so readily he made no movement but only waited in an instant the dawn was blotted out by a vast black shadow and swifter than any great bear could strike a scaly hand had struck one of the friends of beowulf in an instant the man was torn from limb to limb, and in a wild disgust and hatred Beowulf heard the lapping of blood, the scrunching of bones and chewing of warm flesh as the monster ravenously devoured him. Again the loathsome hand was stretched out to seize and to devour. But in the darkness two hands, like hands of iron, gripped the outstretched arm, and the Grendel knew that he had met his match at last. The warriors of Beowulf awoke to find a struggle going on, such as their eyes never before beheld, for it was a fight to the death between man and monster. Vainly they tried to aid their leader, but their weapons only glanced harmlessly off the Grendel's scaly hide. Up and down the hall the combatants wrestled until the walls shook and the great building itself rocked to its foundations. Ever and again it seemed as though no human power could prevail against teeth and claws and demonic fury, and as tables and benches crashed to the ground and broke under the tramping feet of the Grendel, it appeared an impossible thing that Beowulf should overcome. Yet ever tighter and more tight grew the iron grip of Beowulf. His fingers seemed turned to iron. His hatred and loathing made his grasp crash through scales into flesh and crush the marrow out of the bone it found there. And when, at length, the Grendel could no more, and with a terrible cry wrenched himself free and fled wailing back to the Finland, 
Still in his grasp Beowulf held the limb. The Grendel had freed himself by tearing the whole arm out of its socket, and for once the trail of blood across the moors was that of the monster and not of its victims. Great indeed was the rejoicing of Hrothgar and of his people when, in the morning, instead of crimson-stained rushes and the track of vermin claws imbrued in human blood, they found all but one of the men from Gothland alive, and looked upon the hideous trophy that told them that their enemy could only have gone to find a shameful death in the marshes. They cleansed out the great hall, hung it with lordly trappings, and made it once more fit habitation for the lordliest in the land. That night a feast was held in it, such as had never before been held all through the magnificent reign of Hrothgar. The best of the skalds sung songs in honour of the triumph of Beowulf, and the queen herself pledged the hero in a cup of mead and gave to him the beautiful, most richly jewelled collar, Brissingamen, of exquisite ancient workmanship that once was owned by Freya, queen of the gods, and a great ring of the purest red gold. To Beowulf, too, the king gave a banner, all broidered in gold, a sword of the finest, with helmet and corslet, and eight fleet steeds. And on the back of the one that he deemed the best, Hrothgar had placed his own saddle, cunningly wrought, and decked with golden ornaments. To each of the warriors of Beowulf there were also given rich gifts, and ere the queen with her maidens left the hall that night, she said to Beowulf, Enjoy thy reward, O dear Beowulf, while enjoy it thou canst. Live noble and blessed, keep well thy great fame, and to my dear sons in time to come should ever they be in need, be a kind protector. With happy hearts and very weary bodies, Beowulf and his men left the hall when the feast was ended, and they slept through the night in another lodging, as those sleep who have faced death through a very long night, and to whom joy has come in the morning. But the Danish knights careless in the knowledge that the Grendel must even now be in his dying agonies, and that once more Heorot was for them a safe and noble sleeping-place, lay themselves down to sleep in the hall, their shields at their heads, and fastened high up on the roof above them the hideous trophy of Beowulf. Next morning, as the grey dawn broke over the northern sea, it saw a sight that made it more chill than death. Across the moorland went a thing, half wolf, half woman, the mother of Grendel. The creature she had born had come home to die, and to her belonged his avenging. Softly she went to Heorot, softly she opened the unguarded door. Gladly in her savage jaws she seized Ashir, the thane who was to Hrothgar most dear, and from the roof she plucked her desired treasure, the arm of Grendel, her son. Then she trotted off to her far-off, filthy den, leaving behind her the noise of lamentation. Terrible was the grief of Hrothgar over the death of Ashir, dearest of friends and sharer of his counsels. And to his lamentations Beowulf listened, sad at heart, humble, yet with a heart that burned for vengeance. The hideous creature of the night was the mother of Grendel, as all knew well. On her Beowulf would be avenged, for Ashir's sake, for the king's, and for the sake of his own honour. Then once again did he pledge himself to do all that man's strength could do to rid the land of an evil thing. Well did he know how dangerous was the task before him, and he gave directions for the disposal of all that he valued should he never return from his quest. To the king, who feared greatly that he was going forth on a forlorn hope, he said, Grieve not. Each man must undergo death at the end of life. Let him win, while he may, warlike fame in the world. That is best, after death, for the slain warrior. 
his own men and hrothgar and a great company of danes went with him when he set out to trace the blood-stained tracks of the grendel's mother near the edge of a gloomy mere they found the head of a shear and when they looked at the fjord itself it seemed to be blood-stained stained with blood that ever welled upwards and in which revelled with a fierce sort of joy the rapture of bestial cruelty water monsters without number beowulf his face white and grim like that of an image of thor cast in silver watched a little while then drew his bow and drove a bolt into the heart of one of them and when they had drawn the slain carcass to shore the thanes of hrothgar marvelled at the horror of it then beowulf took leave of hrothgar and told him that if in two days he did not return certain it would be that he would return no more the hearts of all who said farewell to him were heavy but beowulf laughed and bade them be of good cheer then into the black waters he dived sword in hand clad in ring armour and the dark pool closed over him as the river of death closes over the head of a man when his day is done to him it seemed as if the space of a day had passed ere he reached the bottom and in his passing he encountered many dread dangers from tusk and horn of a myriad evil creatures of the water who sought to destroy him then at length he reached the bottom of that sinister mirror and there was clasped in the murderous grip of the wolf-woman who strove to crush his life out against her loathsome breast again and again when her hideous embrace failed to slay him she stabbed him with her knife yet ever did he escape his good armour resisted the power of her arm and his own great muscles thrust her from him yet his own sword failed him when he would have smitten her and the hero would have been in evil case had he not spied hanging on the wall of that most foul den a glorious sword an old brand gigantic trusty in point and edge an heirloom of heroes swiftly he seized it and with it he dealt the wolf-woman a blow that shore her head from her body through the foul blood that flowed from her and that mingled with the black water of the mere beowulf saw a very terrible horror the body of the grendel lying moaning out of the last of his life again his strong arm descended and his left hand gripping the coiled locks of the evil thing he sprang upwards through the water that lost its blackness and its clouded crimson as he went ever higher and more high in his hand he still bore the sword that had saved him but the poisonous blood of the dying monsters had made the water of such fiery heat that the blade melted as he rose and only the hilt with strange runes engraved upon it remained in his hand where he left them his followers and the danes who went with them remained watching waiting ever growing more hopeless as night turned into day and day faded into night and they saw the black waters of the lonely fen bubbling up terrible and blood-stained but when the waters cleared hope returned to their hearts and when at length beowulf uprose from the water of the mere and they saw that in his hand he bore the head of the grendel there was no lonely scour nor cliff nor rock of the land of the danes that did not echo the glad cry of beowulf beowulf well nigh overwhelmed by gifts from those whom he had preserved was the hero beowulf but in modest wise words he spoke to the king well hast thou treated us if on this earth i can do more to win thy love o prince of warriors than i have wrought as yet here stand i ready now weapons to wield for thee if i shall ever hear o'er the encircling flood that any neighbouring foes threaten thy nation's fall as grendel grim before swift will i bring to thee thousands of noble thanes heroes to help thee then in their ship that the warden of the coast once had challenged beowulf and his warriors set sail for their own dear land gaily the vessel danced over the waves heavy though it was with treasure nobly gained 
and when beowulf had come in safety to his homeland and had told his kinsmen the tale of the slaying of the grendel and of the wolf-woman he gave the finest of his steeds to the king and to the queen the jewelled collar brisingamen that the queen of the goths had bestowed on him and the heart of his uncle was glad and proud indeed and there was much royal banqueting in the hero's honour of him too the skalds made up songs and there was no hero in all that northern land whose fame was as great as was the fame of beowulf the must be often helps an undoomed man when he is brave was the precept on which he ruled his life and he never failed the king whose chief champion and warrior he was when in an expedition against the frieslanders king hygelac fell a victim to the cunning of his foes the sword of beowulf fought nobly for him to the end and the hero was a grievously wounded man when he brought back to gothland the body of the dead king the goths would fain have made him their king in hygelac's stead but beowulf was too loyal a soul to supplant his uncle's own son on his shield he laid the infant prince hardred and held him up for the people to see and when he had proclaimed the child king and vowed to serve him faithfully all the days of his life there was no man there who did not loyally echo the promise of their hero beowulf when hardred a grown man was treacherously slain by a son of othar he who discovered the north cape beowulf once again was chosen king and for forty years he reigned wisely and well the fame of his arms kept war away from the land and his wisdom as a statesman brought great prosperity and happiness to his people he had never known fear and so for him there was nothing to dread when the weakness of age fell upon him and when he knew that his remaining years could be but few seeing that death a necessary end will come when it will come through all those years of peace the thing that was to bring death to him had lurked unknown unimagined in a cave in the lonely mountains many centuries before the birth of beowulf a family of mighty warriors had won by their swords a priceless treasure of weapons and of armor of richly chased goblets and cups of magnificent ornaments and precious jewels and of gold beyond the dreams of avarice in a great cave among the rocks it was hoarded by the last of their line and on his death none knew where it was hidden upon it one day there stumbled a fiery dragon a fire drake and for three hundred years the monster gloated unchallenged over the magnificent possession but at the end of that time a bondsman who fled before his master's vengeance and sought sanctuary in the mountains came on an opening in the rocks and creeping in found the fire drake asleep upon a mass of red gold and of sparkling gems that dazzled his eyes even in the darkness for a moment he stood trembling then sure of his master's forgiveness if he brought him as gift a golden cup all studded with jewels he seized one and fled with it ere the monster could awake with its awakening terror fell upon the land hither and thither it flew searching for him who had robbed it and as it flew it sent flames on the earth and left behind it a black trail of ruin and of death when news of its destroyings came to the ears of the father of his people beowulf knew that to him belonged the task of saving the land for them and for all those to come after them but he was an old man and strength had gone from him nor was he able now to wrestle with the fire drake as once he had wrestled with the grendel and the wolf woman but had to trust to his arms he had an iron shield made to withstand the fire drake's flaming breath and with a band of eleven picked followers and taking the bondsman as guide beowulf went out to fight his last fight as they drew near the place he bade his followers stay where they were for i alone he said will win the gold and save my people or death shall take me 
from the entrance to the cave there poured forth a sickening cloud of steam and smoke suffocating and blinding and so hot that he could not go forward but with a loud voice the old warrior shouted an arrogant challenge of defiance to his enemy and the fire drake rushed forth from its lair roaring with the roar of an unquenchable fire whose fury will destroy a city from its wings of flame and from its eyes heat poured forth scorchingly and its great mouth belched forth devouring flames as it cast itself on beowulf the hero's sword flashed and smote a stark blow upon its scaly head but beowulf could not deal death strokes as once he had done and only for a moment was his adversary stunned in hideous rage the monster coiled its snaky folds around him and the heat from his body made the iron shield redden as though the blacksmith and his smithy were welding it and each ring of the armor that beowulf wore seared right into his flesh his breast swelled with the agony and his great heart must have come near bursting for pain and for sorrow for he saw that panic had come on his followers and that they were fleeing leaving him to his fate yet not all of them were faithless wiglaf young and daring a dear kinsman of beowulf from whom he had received many a kindness calling shame on the dastards who fled rushed forward sword in hand and with no protection but that of his shield of linden wood like a leaf scorched in a furnace the shield curled up but new strength came to beowulf with the knowledge that wiglaf had not failed him in his need together the two heroes made a gallant stand although blood flowed in a swift red stream from a wound that the monster had made in beowulf's neck with its venomous fangs and ran down his corslet a stroke which left the fire drake unharmed shivered the sword that had seen many fights but wiglaf smote a shrewd blow ere his lord could be destroyed and beowulf swiftly drew his broad knife and with an effort so great that all the life that was left in him seemed to go with it he shore the fire drake asunder then beowulf knew that his end drew very near and when he had thanked wiglaf for his loyal help he bade him enter the cave and bring forth the treasure that he might please his dying eyes by looking on the riches that he had won for his people and wiglaf hastened into the cave for he knew that he raced with death and brought forth armfuls of weapons of magnificent ornaments of goblets and of cups of bars of red gold handfuls of sparkling jewels too he brought and each time he came and went seizing without choosing whatever lay nearest it seemed as though the fire drake's hoard were endless a magical golden standard and armor and swords that the dwarfs had made brought a smile of joy into the dying king's eyes and when the ten shamed warriors seeing that the fight was at an end came to where their mighty ruler lay they found him lying near the vile carcass of the monster he had slain and surrounded by a dazzlement of treasure uncountable to them and to wiglaf beowulf spoke his valediction urging on them to maintain the honor of the land of the goths and then he said i thank god eternal the great king of glory for the vast treasures which i here gaze upon that i ere my death day might for my people win so great wealth since i have given my life thou must now look to the needs of the nation here dwell i no longer for destiny calleth me bid thou my warriors after my funeral pyre build me a burial cairn high on the sea cliff's head it shall for memory tower up to ronusness so that the seafarers beowulf's barrow henceforth shall name it they who drive far and wide over the mighty flood their foaming reels thou art the last of all the kindred of wagmund vired has swept all my kin all the brave chiefs away now must i follow them such was the passing of beowulf greatest of northern heroes and under a mighty barrow on a cliff very high above the sea they buried him 
and with him a great fortune from the treasure he had won then with heavy hearts round about the mound rode his hearth-sharers who sang that he was of kings of men the mildest kindest to his people sweetest and the readiest in search of praise gentlest most gracious most keen to win glory and if in time the great deeds of a mighty king of the goths have become more like fairy tale than solid history this at least we know that whether it is in zealand or on the yorkshire coast where high on the sea cliff ledges the white gulls are trooping and crying the barrow of beowulf covers a very valiant hero a very perfect gentleman end of beowulf recording by james k white chula vista section 32 of a book of myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista a book of myths by jean lang section 32 roland the paladin roland the flower of chivalry expired at Roncesvalles. thomas campbell hero worship endures forever while man endures carlyle roland the good knight turpin's history of charlemagne the old chroniclers tell us that on that momentous morning when william the conqueror led his army to victory at hastings a norman knight named tyafer and a figure of iron surely was his spurred his horse to the front in face of the enemy who hated all things that had to do with france he lifted up his voice and chanted aloud the exploits of charlemagne and of roland as he sang he threw his sword in the air and always caught it in his right hand as it fell and proudly the whole army moving at once joined with him in the chanson de roland and shouted as chorus god be our help god be our help taillefer chantois de roland et d'oliver et de vassaux qui mourront en ronchevaux was roman de rose fifteen thousand of those who sang fell on that bloody day and one wonders how many of those who went down to the shades owed half their desperate courage to the remembrance of the magnificent deeds of the hero of whom they sang ere ever sword met sword or spear met the sullen impact of the stark frame of a briton born fighting for his own the story of roland so we are told is only a splendid coating of paint put on a very slender bit of drawing a contemporary chronicle tells of the battle of roncesvalles and says in which battle was slain roland perfect of the marches of brittany merely a briton squire we are told to believe a very gallant country gentleman whose name would not have been preserved in priestly archives had he not won for himself by his fine courage such an unfading laurel crown but because we are so sure that it is the memory that the soldier leaves after him like the long trail of light that follows the sunken sun and because so often oral tradition is less misleading than the written word we gladly and undoubtingly give roland high place in the valhalla of heroes of all races and of every time 777 or 778 a d is the date fixed for the great fight at roncesvalles where roland won death and glory charlemagne king of the franks and head of the holy roman empire was returning victoriously from a seven years campaign against the saracens in spain no fortress stands before him unsubdued nor wall nor city left to be destroyed save one the city of saragossa the stronghold of king marsile or marsiglio 
here amongst the mountains the king and his people still held to their idols worshipped mohammed apollo and termagant and looked forward with horror to a day when the mighty charlemagne might by the power of the sword thrust upon them the worship of the crucified christ ere charlemagne had returned to his own land marsile held a council with his peers to believe that the great conqueror would rest content with saragossa still unconquered was too much to hope for surely he would return to force his religion upon them what then was it best to do a very wily emir was blancandrin brave in war and wise in council and on his advice marsile sent ambassadors to charlemagne to ask of him upon what conditions he would be allowed to retain his kingdom in peace and to continue to worship the gods of his fathers mounted on white mules with silver saddles and with reins of gold and bearing olive branches in their hands blancandrin and the ten messengers sent by marsile arrived at cordoba where charlemagne rested with his army fifteen thousand tried veterans were with him there and his douceperre his twelve peers who were to him what the knights of the round table were to king arthur of britain he held his court in an orchard and under a great pine tree from which the wild honeysuckle hung like a fragrant canopy the mighty king and emperor sat on a throne of gold the messengers of marsile saw a man of much more than ordinary stature and with the commanding presence of one who might indeed conquer kingdoms but his sword was laid aside and he watched contentedly the contests between the older of his knights who played chess under the shade of the fruit trees and the fencing bouts of the younger warriors very dear to him were all his douceperre yet dearest of all was his own nephew roland in him he saw his own youth again his own imperiousness his reckless gallantry his utter fearlessness all those qualities which endeared him to the hearts of other men roland was his sister's son and it was an evil day for the fair bertha when she told her brother that in spite of his anger and scorn she had disobeyed his commands and had wed the man she loved milan a poor young knight no longer would charlemagne recognize her as sister and in obscurity and poverty roland was born he was still a very tiny lad when his father in attempting to ford a flooded river was swept downstream and drowned and bertha had no one left to fend for her and for her child soon they had no food left and the little roland watched with amazed eyes his famished mother growing so weak that she could not rise from the bed where she lay nor answer him when he pulled her by the hand and tried to make her come with him to seek his father and to find something to eat and when he saw that it was hopeless the child knew that he must take his father's place and get food for the mother who lay so pale and so very still into a great hall where charlemagne and his lords were banqueting roland strayed here was food in plenty savory smelling delicious to his little empty stomach were the daintily cooked meats which the emperor and his court ate from off their silver platters only one plateful of food such as this must of a surety make his dear mother strong and well once more not for a moment did roland hesitate even as a tiny sparrow darts into a lion's cage and picks up a scrap almost out of the monarch's hungry jaws so acted roland a plateful of food stood beside the king at this roland sprang seized it with both hands and joyfully ran off with his prey when the serving men would have caught him charlemagne laughing bade them desist a hungry one this he said and very bold so the meal went on and when roland had fed his mother with some pieces of the rich food and had seen her gradually revive yet another thought came to his baby mind my father gave her wine he thought they were drinking wine in that great hall it will make her white cheeks red again thus he ran back as fast as his legs could carry him 
and Charlemagne smiled yet more when he saw the beautiful child who knew no fear return to the place where he had thieved. Right up to the king's chair he came, solemnly measured with his eye the cups of wine that the great company quaffed, saw that the cup of Charlemagne was the most beautiful and the fullest of the purple-red wine, stretched out a daring little hand, grasped the cup, and prepared to go off again like a marauding bright-eyed bird. Then the king seized in his own hand the hand that held the cup. No, no, bold thief, he said. I cannot have my golden cup stolen from me, be it done by ever so sturdy a robber. Tell me, who sent thee out to steal? And Roland, an erect, gallant little figure, his hand still in the iron grip of the king, fearlessly and proudly gazed back into the eyes of Charlemagne. No one sent me, he said. My mother lay very cold and still and would not speak, and she had said my father would come back no more, so there was none but me to seek her food. Give me the wine, I say, for she is so cold and so very, very white. And the child struggled to free his hand that still held the cup. Who art thou, then? asked Charlemagne. My name is Roland. Let me go, I pray thee and again he tried to drag himself free. And Charlemagne mockingly said, Roland, I fear thy father and mother have taught thee to be a clever thief. Then anger blazed in Roland's eyes. My mother is a lady of high degree, he cried, and I am her page, her cupbearer, her knight. I do not speak false words. And he would have struck the king for very rage. Then Charlemagne turned to his lords and asked, Who is this child? And one made answer, He is the son of thy sister Bertha, and of Milan the knight, who was drowned these three weeks agone. Then the heart of Charlemagne grew heavy with remorse when he found that his sister had so nearly died of want, and from that day she never knew aught but kindness and tenderness from him, while Roland was dear to him as his own child. He was a douce now, and when the envoys from Saragossa had delivered their message to Charlemagne, he was one of those who helped to do them honor at a great feast that was held for them in a pavilion raised in the orchard. Early in the morning Charlemagne heard mass, and then, on his golden throne under the great pine, he sat and took counsel with his douce not one of them trusted Marsile, but Ganelon, who had married the widowed Bertha, and who had a jealous hatred for his stepson, so beloved by his mother, so loved and honored by the king, was ever ready to oppose the counsel of Roland. Thus did he persuade Charlemagne to send a messenger to Marsile, commanding him to deliver up the keys of Saragossa, in all haste to become a Christian, and in person to come and with all humility pay homage as vassal to Charlemagne. Then arose the question as to which of the peers should bear the arrogant message. Roland, ever greedy for the post of danger, impetuously asked that he might be chosen. But Charlemagne would have neither him nor his dear friend and fellow knight Oliver, he who was the Jonathan of Roland's David, nor would he have Nim de Bavier, nor Turpin, the chivalrous and undaunted bishop of Reims. He could not afford to risk their lives, and Marsile was known to be treacherous. Then he said to his peers, Choose ye for me whom I shall send. Let it be one who is wise, brave, yet not over rash, and who will defend mine honor valiantly. Then Roland, who never knew an ungenerous thought, quickly said, Then indeed it must be Ganelon who goes, for if he goes or if he stays, you have none better than he. And all the other peers applauded the choice, and Charlemagne said to Ganelon, Come hither, Ganelon, and receive my staff and glove, which the voice of all the Franks have given to thee. But the honor which all the others coveted, was not held to be an honor by Ganelon. In furious rage he turned upon Roland. 
you and your friends have sent me to my death he cried but if by a miracle i should return look you to yourself roland for assuredly i shall be revenged and roland grew red then very white and said i had taken thee for another man ganelon gladly will i take thy place wilt give me the honour to bear thy staff and glove to saragossa sire and eagerly he looked charlemagne in the face eager as when a child he had craved the cup of wine for his mother's sake but charlemagne with darkened brow shook his head ganelon must go he said for so have i commanded go for the honour of jesus christ and for your emperor thus sullenly and unwillingly and with burning hatred against roland in his heart ganelon accompanied the saracens back to saragossa a hate so bitter was not easy to hide and as he rode beside him the wily blancandrin was not long in laying a probing finger on this festering sore soon he saw that ganelon would pay even the price of his honour to revenge himself upon roland and on the other douceberet whose lives were more precious than his in the eyes of charlemagne yet when saragossa was reached like a brave man and a true did ganelon deliver the insulting message that his own brain had conceived and that the emperor with magnificent arrogance had bidden him deliver and this he did although he knew his life hung but by a thread while marsile and the saracen lords listened to his words but marsile kept his anger under thinking with comfort of what blancandrin had told him of his discovery by the way and very soon he had shown ganelon how he might be avenged on roland and on the friends of roland and in a manner which his treachery need never be known and very rich were the bribes that he offered to the faithless knight thus it came about that ganelon sold his honour and bargained with the saracens to betray roland and his companions into their hands in their passage of the narrow defiles of roncesvalles for more than fifty pieces of silver marsile purchased the soul of ganelon and when this judas of the douceberre returned in safety to cordova bringing with him princely gifts for charlemagne the keys of saragossa and the promise that in sixteen days marsile would repair to france to do homage and to embrace the christian faith the emperor was happy indeed all had fallen out as he desired ganelon who had gone forth in wrath had returned calm and gallant and had carried himself throughout his difficult embassy as a wise statesman and a brave and loyal soldier thou hast done well ganelon said the king i give thanks to my god and to thee thou shalt be well rewarded the order then was speedily given for a return to france and for ten miles the great army marched before they halted and encamped for the night but when charlemagne slept instead of dreams of peace he had two dreams which disturbed him greatly in the first ganelon roughly seized the imperial spear of tough ash wood and it broke into splinters in his hand in the next charlemagne saw himself attacked by a leopard and a bear which tore off his right arm and as a greyhound darted to his aid he awoke and rose from his couch heavy at heart because of those dreams of evil omen in the morning he held a council and reminded his knights of the dangers of the lonely pass of roncesvalles it was a small oval plain shut in all round save on the south where the river found its outlet by precipitous mountain ridges densely covered with beech woods mountains ran sheer up to the sky above it precipices rushed sheer down below and the path that crossed the crest of the pyrenees and led to it was so narrow that it must be traversed in single file the dangers for the rear guard naturally seemed to charlemagne to be the greatest and to his douceberre he turned as before for counsel who then shall command the rear guard he asked and quickly ganelon answered who but roland 
ever would he seek the post where danger lies and charlemagne feeling he owed much to ganelon gave way to his counsel though with heavy forebodings in his heart then all the other dusperets save ganelon said that for love of roland they would go with him and see him safely through the dangers of the way loudly they vaunted his bravery for dread of death he hid never his head leaving them behind with twenty thousand men and with ganelon commanding the vanguard charlemagne started christ keep you he said on parting with roland i betake you to christ and roland clad in his shining armor his lordly helmet on his head his sword durendala by his side his horn oliphant slung round him and his flower-painted shield on his arm mounted his good steed Bellantif, and holding his bright lance with its white pennon and golden fringe in his hand led the way for his fellow knights and for the other franks who so dearly loved him not far from the pass of roncesvalles he saw gleaming against the dark side of the purple mountain the spears of the saracens ten thousand men under sir gautier were sent by roland to reconnoitre but from every side the heathen pressed upon them and every one of the ten thousand were slain hurled into the valley far down below gautier alone sorely wounded returned to roland to tell him ere his life ebbed away of the betrayal by ganelon and to warn him of the ambush yet even then they were at roncesvalles and the warning came too late afar off amongst the beech trees and coming down amongst the lonely passes of the mountains the franks could see the gleam of silver armor and oliver well knowing that not even the most dauntless valor could withstand such a host as the one that came against them besought roland to blow a blast on his magic horn that charlemagne might hear and return to aid him and all the other douceperets begged of him that thus he would call for help but roland would not listen to them i will fight with them that us hath sought and or i see my breast blood through my harness run blow never horn for no help then through the night they knew their enemies were coming ever nearer hemming them in but there were no night alarms and day broke fair and still there was no wind there was dew on the grass dew dimmed the flowers and amongst the trees the birds sang merrily at daybreak the good bishop turpin celebrated mass and blessed them and even as his voice ceased they beheld the saracen host close upon them then roland spoke brave words of cheer to his army and commended their souls and his own to christ who suffered for us pains sore and for whose sake they had to fight the enemies of the cross behind every tree and rock a saracen seemed to be hidden and in a moment the whole pass was alive with men in mortal strife surely never in any fight were greater prodigies of valor performed than those of roland and his comrades twelve saracen kings fell before their mighty swords and many a saracen warrior was hurled down the cliffs to pay for the lives of the men of france whom they had trapped to their death never before in one day did one man slay so many as did roland and oliver his friend a roland for an oliver was no good exchange and yet a very fair one as the heathen quickly learned red was roland red with bloodshed red his corslet red his shoulders red his arm and red his charger in the thickest of the fight he and oliver came together and roland saw that his friend was using for weapon and dealing death blows with the truncheon of a spear friend what hast thou there cried roland in this game tis not a distaff but a blade of steel thou needest where is now hot clare thy good sword golden hilted crystal pommelled here said oliver so fight i that i have not time to draw it friend quoth roland more i love thee ever henceforth than a brother 
when the sun set on that welter of blood not a single saracen was left and those of the frankish rearguard who still lived were very weary men then roland called on his men to give thanks to god and bishop turpin whose stout arm had fought well on that bloody day offered up thanks for the army though in sorry plight were they almost none unwounded their swords and lances broken and their hauberks rent and blood-stained gladly they laid themselves down to rest beside the comrades whose eyes never more would open on the fair land of france but even as roland was about to take his rest he saw descending upon him and his little band a host of saracens led by marsile himself a hundred thousand men untired and fiercely thirsting for revenge came against the handful of wearied wounded heroes yet with unwavering courage the franks responded to their leader's call the war cry of the soldiers of france montjoui montjoui rang clear above the fierce sound of the trumpets of the saracen army soldiers of the lord cried turpin be ye valiant and steadfast for this day shall crowns be given you midst the flowers of paradise in the name of god our saviour be ye not dismayed nor frighted lest of you be shameful legends chanted by the tongues of minstrels rather let us die victorious since this eve shall see us lifeless heaven has no room for cowards knights who nobly fight and vainly ye shall sit among the holy in the blessed fields of heaven on then friends of god to glory marsile fell the first victim to a blow from the sword of roland and even more fiercely than the one that had preceded it waged this terrible fight and now it seemed as though the powers of good and of evil also took part in the fray for a storm swept down from the mountains thick darkness fell and the rumble of thunder and the rush of heavy rain dulled the shouts of those who fought and the clash and clang of their weapons when a blood-red cloud came up its lurid light showed the trampled ground strewn with dead and dying at that piteous sight roland proposed to send a messenger to charlemagne to ask him for aid but it was then too late when only sixty francs remained the pride of roland gave way to pity for the men whom he had led to death and he took the magic horn oliphant in his hand that he might blow on it a blast that would bring charlemagne his mighty army behind him to wipe out the saracen host that had done him such evil but oliver bitterly protested earlier in the day when he had willed it roland had refused to call for help now the day was done the twilight of death death the inevitable was closing in upon them why then call now for charlemagne when nor he nor any other could help them but turpin with all his force backed the wish of roland the blast of thy horn cannot bring back the dead to life he said yet if our emperor return he can save our corpses and weep over them and bear them reverently to la belle france and there shall they lie in sanctuary and not in a pinum land where the wild beasts devour them and croaking wretches with foul beaks tear our flesh and leave our bones dishonoured that is well said quoth roland and oliver then did roland blow three mighty blasts upon his horn and so great was the third that a blood vessel burst and the red drops trickled from his mouth for days on end charlemagne had been alarmed at the delay of his rear guard but ever the false ganelon had reassured him why shouldst thou fear sire he asked roland has surely gone after some wild boar or deer so fond is he of the chase but when roland blew the blast that broke his mighty heart charlemagne heard it clearly and no longer had any doubt of the meaning of its call he knew that his dreams had come true and at once he set his face towards the dire pass of roncesvalles that he might even at the eleventh hour save roland and his men 
long ere charlemagne could reach the children of his soul who stood in such dire need the uncle of marsile had reached the place of battle with a force of fifty thousand men pierced from behind by a cowardly lance oliver was sobbing out his life's blood yet ever he cried mon joui mon joui and each time his voice formed the words a thrust from his sword or from the lances of his men drove a soul down to hades and when he was breathing his last and lay on the earth humbly confessing his sins and begging god to grant him rest in paradise he asked god's blessing upon charlemagne his lord the king and upon his fair land of france and above all other men to keep free from scathe his heart's true brother and comrade roland the gallant knight then did he gently sigh his last little measure of life away and as roland bent over him he felt that half of the glamour of living was gone yet still so dearly did he love aud the fair the sister of oliver who was to be his bride that his muscles grew taut as he gripped his sword and his courage was the dauntless courage of a furious wave that faces all the cliffs of a rocky coast in a winter storm when again he faced the saracen host of all the douce Pere, only gautier and turpin and roland now remained and with them a poor little handful of maimed men-at-arms soon a saracen arrow drove through the heart of gautier and turpin wounded by four lances stood alone by roland's side but for each lance thrust he slew a hundred men and when at length he fell roland himself sorely wounded seized once more his horn and blew upon it a piercing blast a blast of that dread horn on fontarabian echoes born that to king charles did come when roland brave and olivier and every paladin and peer on roncesvalles died sir walter scott that blast pierced right into the heart of charlemagne and straightway he turned his army towards the pass of roncesvalles that he might succour roland whom he so greatly loved yet then it was too late turpin was nearly dead roland knew himself to be dying vilantif roland's faithful war-horse was enduring agonies from wounds of the pinum arrows and him roland slew with a shrewd blow from his well-tried sword from far far away the hero could hear the blare of the trumpets of the frankish army and at the sound what was left of the saracen host fled in terror he made his way blindly painfully to where turpin lay and with fumbling fingers took off his hauberk and unlaced his golden helmet with what poor skill was left to him he strove to bind up his terrible wounds with strips of his own tunic and he dragged him as gently as he could to a spot under the beech trees where the fresh moss still was green ah gentle lord said roland give me leave to carry here our comrades who are dead whom we so dearly loved they must not lie unblessed but i will bring their corpses here and thou shalt bless them and me ere thou die go said the dying priest but soon return thank god the victory is yours and mine with exquisite pain roland carried the bodies of oliver and of the rest of the douce from the places where they had died to where turpin their dear bishop lay a-dying each step that he took cost him a pang of agony each step took from him a toll of blood yet faithfully he performed his task until they all lay around turpin who gladly blessed them and absolved them all and then the agony of soul and of heart and body that roland had endured grew over much for him to bear and he gave a great cry like the last sigh of a mighty tree that the woodcutters fell and dropped down stiff and chill in a deathly swoon then the dying bishop dragged himself towards him and lifted the horn oliphant and with it in his hand 
he struggled inch by inch with very great pain and labor to a little stream that trickled down the dark ravine that he might fetch some water to revive the hero that he and all men loved but ere he could reach the stream the mists of death had veiled his eyes he joined his hands in prayer though each movement meant a pang and gave his soul to christ his saviour and his captain and so passed away the soul of a mighty warrior and a stainless priest thus was roland alone amongst the dead when consciousness came back to him with feeble hands he unlaced his helmet and tended to himself as best he might and as turpin had done so also did he painfully crawl towards the stream there he found turpin the horn oliphant by his side and knew that it was in trying to fetch him water that the brave bishop had died and for tenderness and pity the hero wept alas brave priest fair lord of noble birth thy soul i give to the great king of heaven may thy fair soul escape the pains of hell and paradise receive thee in its bowers then did roland know that for him also there was no other way but death with dragging steps he toiled uphill a little way his good sword durendola in one hand and in the other his horn oliphant under a little clump of pines were some rough steps hewn in a boulder of marble leading yet higher up the hill and these roland would have climbed but his throbbing heart could no more and again he fell swooning on the ground a saracen who out of fear had feigned death saw him lying there and crawled out of the covert where he lay concealed it is roland the nephew of the emperor he joyously thought and in triumph he said to himself i shall bear his sword back with me but as his pagan hand touched the hilt of the sword and would have torn it from roland's dying grasp the hero was aroused from his swoon one great stroke cleft the saracen's skull and laid him dead at roland's feet then to durendola roland spoke i surely die but ere i end let me be sure that thou art ended too my friend for should a heathen grasp thee when i am clay my ghost would grieve full sore until the judgment day more ghost than man he looked as with a mighty effort of will and of body he struggled to his feet and smote with his blade the marble boulder before the stroke the marble split asunder as though the pickaxe of a miner had cloven it on a rock of sardonyx he strove to break it then but durendola remained unharmed a third time he strove and struck a rock of blue marble with such force that the sparks rushed out as from a blacksmith's anvil then he knew that it was in vain for durendola would not be shattered and so he raised oliphant to his lips and blew a dying blast that echoed down the cliffs and up to the mountain tops and rang through the trees of the forest and still to this day do they say when the spirit of the warrior rides by night down the heights and through the dark pass of roncesvalles even such a blast may be heard waking all the echoes and sounding through the lonely hollows of the hills then he made confession and with a prayer for pardon of his sins and for mercy from the god whose faithful servant and soldier he had been unto his life's end the soul of roland passed away with hands devoutly joined he breathed his last god sent his cherubim saint raphael saint michel de peril together with them gabriel came all bring the soul of count roland to paradise Aoui. charlemagne and his army found him lying thus and very terrible was the grief and the rage of the emperor as he looked on him and on the others of his douce and on the bodies of that army of twenty thousand all the field was with blood o'er round many a good sword was broken there many a fatherless child there was at home by the side of roland 
charlemagne vowed vengeance but ere he avenged his death he mourned over him with infinite anguish the lord have mercy roland on thy soul never again shall our fair france behold a knight so worthy till france be no more how widowed lies our fair france and how lone how will the realms that i have swayed rebel now thou art taken from my weary age so deep my woe that fain would i die too and join my valiant peers in paradise while men inter my weary limbs with thine a terrible vengeance was the one that he took next day when the saracen army was utterly exterminated and when all the noble dead had been buried where they fell save only roland oliver and turpin the bodies of these three heroes were carried to blay and interred with great honour in the great cathedral there charlemagne then returned to aix and as he entered his palace aude the fair sister of oliver and the betrothed of roland hastened to meet him where were the douce what was the moaning murmur as of women who wept that had heralded the arrival in the town of the emperor and his conquering army eagerly she questioned charlemagne of the safety of roland and when the emperor in pitying grief told her roland thy hero like a hero died aude gave a bitter cry and fell to the ground like a white lily slain by a cruel wind the emperor thought she had fainted but when he would have lifted her up he found that she was dead and in infinite pity he had her taken to blay and buried by the side of roland very tender was charlemagne to the maiden whom roland had loved but when the treachery of ganelon had been proved for him there was no mercy at aix la chapelle torn asunder by wild horses he met a shameful and a horrible death nor is his name forgotten as that of the blackest of traitors but the memory of roland and of the other douce lives on and is however fanciful forever fragrant roland and oliver and of the twelve douce that died in the battle of roncevale jesu lord heaven king to his bliss him and us bring to livin withouten bale sir o'toole end of section thirty two recording by james k white chula vista